Okay, so welcome. Thank you for coming to this event. Uh, the, the things we have been happening in Catalonia in October uh, obviously caught the world's attention. Uh, every major television channel reported on the Catalan referendum. Every major newspaper sent uh, correspondents uh, and run op-ed articles uh, on the conflict of legitimacy in Spain. The Catalan challenge to the Spanish state was met not with attempts at diffusing the tension, but with an inordinately uh, aggressive speech by the king that led to the Spanish government's recourse to an ambiguous provision in the constitution, namely Article 155. Madrid interpreted this constitutional guarantee as a tool to declare what amounts to a state of exception over Catalonia. Mariano Rajoy dissolved the Catalan parliament and the national court proceeded to arrest the, the leaders of the grassroots movements and uh, uh, the Catalan government, half of it, while uh, sending an international order for the capture and extradition of uh, the other half, uh, among them Catalan president Carles Puigdemont. The situation that was created in this way has no precedent in any democratic society, certainly not in any of the member states of the European Union. Uh, Rajoy imposed regional elections on December 21st, which will be taking place after a campaign that is now unfolding with the leaders of the two mainstream Catalan parties in prison and exile, respectively with unchecked right-wing violence of an intensity that, uh, and an impunity that has not been seen since the transition to democracy, with attacks on and censorship of the Catalan public media, and the imputation of hundreds of people for crimes of opinion. The overall question to, the, to be debated here this afternoon is whether the peaceful, but in the literal sense of the Constitution, illegal referendum of October 1st, on the one hand, and the bending of the law to the limit by the Spanish government, on the other hand, reveal a crisis of legitimation of the Spanish regime of 1978. And as a collateral to this question, I expect that uh, we will also be discussing the implications of this situation for the European Union, which is a supranational project that seems to be stalling between the refusal of member states to cede more sovereignty and the demands of sub-state nationalities to obtain recognition and the benefits of membership and civil rights, guarantees to which they are entitled, at least in principle. Now, this event has been made possible with the support of the Division of Literatures, Cultures, and Languages, the Department of Iberian and Latin American Cultures, and the Iberian Studies Program. And here I must uh, make a disclaimer. Um, because the Iberian Studies Program is part and parcel, is integrated into the Europe Center at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford, and the Europe Center did not support this event, um, uh, and uh, therefore uh, does, not, uh, does not wish to be uh, associated with it, and I am compelled for this very reason to clarify their position. Now, on the other hand, it has to be said that it was originally an initiative of the Department of Iberian and Latin American Cultures, and here I really want to thank my colleagues for their interest in what is doubtless a historical development in Spain, a development that will be studied for years to come. So, the plan is to proceed uh, as follows. Uh, each participant at this table will uh, make a preliminary statement in the area of their, of their expertise. And this will be followed by a round of questions that I will be addressing to each one of them, uh, but that will also allow the rest of them to intervene at will. And once that round of questions has taken place, I will be opening the floor to questions from the audience. I should also say that, unfortunately, one of the intended participants, Professor Javier Perez Rollo, uh, from the University of Seville uh, was unable to travel, uh, but uh, we hope that he'll be joining us uh, through technology uh, via Skype or uh, similar uh, such thing, and that uh, he will be with us shortly 
And I mentioned this because uh, he also uh, said that he intended to be with us for the duration of the event. And that means that once the floor is open for questions, uh, anybody can direct questions to him as well as to the people physically present at the table. So uh, uh, I think that it will be best rather than to uh, introduce all of the speakers at once, to introduce each one uh, in turn as uh, in the order in, in which they will be speaking. And the first one uh, will be uh, Dr. Elizenda Paluzzi, who's the Dean of the Department of Economics of the University of Barcelona. She directs the Center for Economic Analysis and Social Policies at that university. Uh, Dr. Paluzzi has a master's degree in international economics and development from Yale University, a doctoral degree in economics from the University of Barcelona, and has uh, had various postdoctoral research uh, fellowships at the London School of Economics and the Paris School of Economics and others. She has published articles in international journals, reputable international journals in her field, and is the author of the book, Podem, Las Claus de la Viabilitat Econòmica de la Catalunya Independent. Yes, we can. The keys to the economic viability of an independent Catalonia. So, without further ado, uh, she will uh, do her presentation. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would, I would like to thank Professor Ressina for having invited me to participate in this event, in this prestigious university. I could enjoy the campus for a few days and it was really enjoyable. Um, I will try to summarize a lot of the economic issues at stake because we only have 10 minutes uh, to do this presentation. Uh, I will follow this outline. Yeah, okay. I will follow this outline. I would first place the Catalan case within a broader context, the context of globalization and the creation of new countries. Then I will talk briefly about the benefits of independence, mainly the, the fiscal, what is has been called the fiscal dividend. Then I will uh, tackle the economic costs of independence, mainly the commercial boycott. And finally, I will talk a little bit about the current situation and I will conclude with the final remarks. studied at the end of the 90s by a whole field of the political economy literature led by professors Alessina and Enrico Spolaore that produced this book, The Size of Nations, in 2003. Their main theory is that countries are the result of a trade-off between two opposed forces. On the one hand, there are such battle forces that favor, agglomeration, uh, uh, favor large countries. Uh, the scale, existence of scale-up economies in the provision of public goods, the existence of market sites advantages in the production of private goods. And then there are centrifugal forces that are more favorable to small countries, mainly what is called heterogeneity cost, the fact that preferences in a diverse uh, population, in a larger population, are diverse, and it's more difficult to satisfy them. In this context, Um, in, in a context when the world is um, dominated by protectionism, centripetal forces are stronger because you need to benefit from a large domestic market. On the other hand, with trade liberalization, centripetal forces lose importance. Firms can sell to the world market. There's no need to belong to a larger country uh, to benefit from the market. The Catalan case fits perfectly with this theory because um, in the, it was in the second half of the 19th century when Catalonia became Spanish factory in a context of domestic market integration and uh, scale economies under reduction in the internal transport cost consolidated Catalonia initial advantage in a context of protectionism. Uh, but since 1986 with the integration to the European economy um, as well as world trade liberalization, 
uh, the importance of the Spanish market for the uh, Catalan economy has been reduced. We can illustrate this with new. We can illustrate the weakening of the centripetal forces with this graph that has this perfect scissors uh, structure, uh, where we see that the sales to the um, the sales to the um, uh, external market, which are in red, have increased steadily, while the sales to the in, uh, Spanish market have decreased. Nowadays, uh, the external sales of the Catalan economy go uh, more than 60% to the external markets and 39% uh, to, the, to the Spanish market. This uh, other figure also illustrates that point. Here we have the sales of commodities of Catalan firms in 2014 divided in three main markets. The Catalan market that accounts for 31% of the sales, the Spanish market that accounts only for 27% of the sales, and the external market, the EU and the rest of the world, that account for 42% uh, of uh, Catalan sales. At the same time, this is for centripetal forces, not the beginning of the domestic market attraction force. At the same time, there has been a reinforcement of centrifugal forces. <laughs> I'm really not. Okay, here. Uh, there has been a reinforcement of centrifugal forces. Uh, what is that? That the distance of the median voter in Catalonia from the central government policies has increased. Why? Because of the Constitutional Court decision on the Statute of Autonomy in 2010, my colleagues will talk about that, on uh, the existence of increasing conflicts with the Catalan language, mainly it's used in school, and also public administration, plenty of competence conflicts, power conflicts, uh, laws approved by the Catalan Parliament that, that then are annulated by the Constitutional Court or directly by the Spanish uh, government. Uh, there's also the fiscal relationship between Catalonia and Spain that has been perceived uh, as unjust, and the scarcity of investment in infrastructures, productive infrastructures needed for the for a Catalan uh, exporter economy. So that means that the main benefit of the of the independence. The main benefit of independence has been calculated as the fiscal dividend. No? The fact that the, actually in the current situation, the Catalan fiscal balance, that is the difference between taxes collected in Catalonia and spending received by Catalonia, is highly deficitary. The reasons of this uh, deficitary fiscal balance uh, come from two many reasons, but from two main reasons. One is the regional financing system, which is a highly centralized financial structure uh, more than 90% of the taxes are centrally collected by the Spanish government and, and then assigned in a needs assessment formula that uh, produces a, a phenomenon that we know as over-equalization. And the other reason is the spending patterns of the central government, particularly in infrastructures. The fiscal balance Uh, this is, uh, the fiscal balance can be calculated by two methods. The Catalan government has calculated it since 1986 for, by these two methods. And it gives, uh, with the monetary flow method, the result is a 16 billion euros per year, which accounts to, which represents 8% of Catalan GDP. And the other method that is more favorable to the capital of the states, to Madrid in this case, the benefit approach, um, is, estimates a fiscal deficit for Catalonia of uh, 10 billion euros per year, uh, which accounts for 5% of Catalan GDP. The Spanish government has, in the last years, uh, commanded the calculus of this fiscal balance to a private institute, FEDEA. They have done it only by the second method, the benefit approach, and the results are very similar to that, those obtained by the Catalan government, that is 10 billion euros and 5% of Catalan GDP. Uh, to express these uh, magnitudes in a more meaningful way, we can say, from the figures of the Catalan government, that Catalonia is contributing yearly 
to 19.5% of the revenues of the central administration and the social security, and receives at 14% of the central administration and social security expenditures, while it represents 16% of the Spanish population and 19% uh, of the Spanish GDP. Uh, if we exclude social security from the calculus, and, only, and we leave out only discretionary public expenditure, then the figures are more um, are more, more big, uh, in the sense that Catalonia is contributing to 19.7% of the of the revenues and receiving only 11% of the of the central administration expenditures. As said in an, another way, more meaningful, that is the way that is used by the by an economic institute in the states to calculate the fiscal balances for the U.S. states, is the return of each euro paid in taxes to the central government. Uh, so of each euro paid, 44 cents are, spent, are not spent in Catalonia, and 56 cents are spent in Catalonia. Yeah, almost consumed all the time. Um, so this is our expenditure in infrastructures. We can see that in the last years, it's about 10 percent of total expen uh, total expenditure in infrastructures of central government. And it has never it, it, it reached the level of uh, Catalan population for a few years after the Statute of Autonomy. And then this is a complicated graph, and I won't have time to go focus a lot in it. But it's an explanation of the results of the regional financial system. On the left column, we have what is collected in each region on the taxes that are shared by the regions, that are not all taxes, only the 50% uh, of the revenue tax and 50% of the value-added tax. Uh, so this graph, this figure illustrates what we call a over equalization. Rich regions, are, as Catalonia, are, um, are collecting uh, taxes uh, in a rank of the third uh, autonomous community in Spain, and then um, have these equalization funds that decrease the amount of money per person they have to spend in the same services, and they end up below average. So it's not to over equalization, is equalization would mean that all regions have to have the same money to provide the same services. The Spanish system over equalizes, and it over equalizes not benefiting. Uh, the poorest regions, with the exception of Extremadura, but benefiting a lot small rich regions such as La Rioja, Aragon, or Cantabria, that are already in the half of the of the table on the left, and then in the right they ended up end up with, uh, for instance, 700 euros per person and per year more than what the Catalan government has to provide the same services. Um, well, as for the costs of independence, we already, when we wrote the book and other authors wrote books on that, uh, after 2012, when the issue started being discussed in the media, um, and we were anticipating a commercial boycott, because we already had the experience of the boycott of Cava, which is the Catalan champagne, in 2005, when the Statute of Autonomy was being discussed in, in Madrid. There was an intense boycott uh, by Spanish consumers of Cava during this Christmas, that Christmas. Um, so, Andra, Paul Andras from Harvard, an uh, international trade theorist from Harvard, and uh, Jean Ventura from Pompeu Fabra um, estimated the, the cost of this boycott and its impact on Catalan GDP. In their, uh, what they were um, saying is that boycott is not going to affect multinationals, foreign multinationals. It's very difficult to boycott uh, an espresso, no? even though an espresso has a factory in Catalonia, but who knows where this espresso has been produced, in Catalonia or in other factories around the world. So they were excluding the multinationals from the boycott, and they were anticipating a catastrophic of a scenario of a reduction of 50% on, on consumer products and 20% in intermediate, intermediate goods. Uh, that would account the impact of a catastrophic scenario such as this one, would represent for Catalan GDP a reduction in Catalan GDP of 1.3% of Catalan GDP. So it's not, it's, it's important, but it's not 
huge, and it's made, it's comp it would be compensated by the fiscal dividend. Also, what we were thinking uh, as economists is that this type of political boycotts are short-term uh, short phenomena and cannot last longer years. In the mid-term and long-term, they vanish. Um, Yeah. Finally, I will talk about uh, the current situation. The current situation, um, as you know, on the 1st of October there was the referendum. On the, um, on the, summarize these two months is a little bit difficult, but I <laughs> There was the approval of a decree facilitating change by the Spanish government, facilitating change in legal headquarters. And the change, con uh, the, the decree meant that there's no need of shareholders' approval to change the legal headquarters. So it's uh, it's retiring uh, power to the shareholders of any company in Spain. And it, this didn't went to the Spanish Parliament. It was a, a decree approved by the Council of Ministers. On October 27, there was the Declaration of Independence, and the same day, direct rule, the 155 article, was approved by the Spanish uh, Senate. On November 2nd, um, three quarters of Catalan government was, were, were, were put in, in jail. In two months, from the October 6th, 2,700 firms moved their legal headquarters. Um, and this has been like the, the main news in all media, international media. It's like the catastrophe, economic catastrophe of independence. Well, first of all, we have to say that in any case, it's not the consequence of independence because independence has not been made effective. Uh, Catalonia is still a Spanish region. It has a, it has a, it's not an independent, and no, it's directly ruled by, by Madrid. No? Uh, but more. Uh, the, the, the reprisals that were organized in order first to prevent the declaration of independence to take place and that delayed it for a few days because there were a lot of economic pressures and also, well, it, it, it's um, part of the economic threats campaign, no? In any case, to put it into context, we have to recall that the number of firms with legal headquarters in Catalonia is 265,000. The number of establishments in Catalonia, like foreign firms or Spanish firms that have, or foreign firms that have establishments in Catalonia, is another 300,000. Uh, the sectors mainly concerned by this movement of legal headquarters were financial sector, all the banks, the two banks that, were, that had their legal headquarters in Catalonia, CaixaBank and Sabadell, um, utilities companies, all the CaixaBank, uh, um, I, I, uh, the Aiguas de Barcelona, Akbar, um, Gas Natural, all the utilities company. A lot of firms are uh, directly linked to public procurement um, with the, an important uh, importance in, in, of the state, of the central government in their, in their accounts. And also food consumer products, because at the same time there was an intense campaign of boycott, much stronger than the one that we had in 2005. Uh, with lists of food consumer products that you shouldn't buy in the supermarket because they were cut. Um, if you, if the firm moved the legal headquarters, the firm was removed from these lists. Um, so the reasons of this movement, maybe in the case of banks, there's a reason linked to the ECB access to credit. Uh, in the event of a non-agreed independence, um, the banks should have access from an EU country, and if Catalonia was excluded from the EU, they couldn't have access from their legal headquarters in Catalonia, but they would need to have a headquarter in Madrid to get this, this access to credit. Um, there was also uncertainty in the financial markets that are the ones that react the most rapidly to any crisis, political crisis. And also, but what was more important was uh, the intense um, deposits boycott that they had for five days. I spoke to a, to a high um, executive in the Casha Bank. Uh, he told me that it lasted five days and it was very, very intense. Like people going to the banks in the rest of Spain and saying we are taking our money out of this bank because it's, it's a Catalan bank and we are moving to another bank. And with the change in the legal headquarters, 
that, uh, that, that boycott stopped complete, almost completely in the west of Spain. Now, let's see if in Catalonia um, there were some movements on the other direction, but there's only two very, very small savings banks left that have the legal headquarters in Catalonia. Uh, then, uh, regulated firms and the firms that depend on the Spanish government, and the commercial boycott. That is, the firms that um, produce consumer goods, mainly food products. Pastas Gallo, plenty of firms that produce food products that you can buy in the supermarket, change the legal headquarters. What are the, the real effects of that? The, the, the media talks about delocalization. Delocalization is when a company moves people and factories or facilities. In this case, there, has been, there hasn't been any single movement of a worker or a facility or a factory. There's just a movement of the legal headquarters. Uh, that means that there's no effect, uh, direct effect in Catalan GDP because uh, the GDP is calculated on economic activity and there's no effect in Catalan government taxes because the only tax that depends on the legal headquarter is the profit tax. And the Catalan government does not participate in the um, revenues of the, of the profit tax. Uh, it only participates in the revenue tax that depends on the, whether the workers leave as, as long as workers do not move, no effect on the revenue tax, and the consumer tax depends on, on the estimation of consumption, so it's not linked to the legal headquarter. Uh, but it has had its effect, especially, especially a media effect and a political effect of creating this feeling of uh, linking um, economic catastrophe to independence. Um, the real effects we will have we will need more time to study all these. That could give uh, origin to many papers in the economic literature because once we have all the data of these firms, we can check to which sectors they belong, etc. And um, uh, here we have uh, the annual growth rate of the Catalan economy. It's an economy that is growing well. It was growing 2% in 2014, 3.5% in 2015, 3.5% in 2016. The prediction for 2017 is 3%. I uh, think that the average growth rate of the Eurozone is only 1.8%. And uh, this is the quarterly rate of growth. And we can see that um, in the last uh, 2007, it would look like the last quarter, the prediction for the last quarter is the prediction we will have the data in January, is lowering, no? Uh, it's still growing at 0.5% uh, in the, uh, quarter to quarter, but has been lowering. But if we look at the quarter of the, say, of the last year, of 2016, it, it happened in the same. It was, it was growing at 0.5, so it doesn't seem there's an effect in the, in the growth rate of the Catalan economy. And finally, uh, finally, just some final remarks, um, is that in an internationalized economy, the creation of a new state from an economic point of view would not pose particular problems. In the context of the EU, of a federal EU, it would be more similar to the creation of a new st state inside the US, for instance, uh, the, the creation of the state of the, the union of the state of Maine to the US in, in 1920, than to a succession from the US. Uh, there could be transition solutions for the to keep the contribution of Catalonia to less developed regions of Spain. For instance, the Varoufakis uh, made a proposal uh, three weeks ago. Uh, he said that the Catalan economy could be contribute to a fund for, for the poorest regions in, in Spain, that, but channeled through the European Investment Bank. So that way you can make sure it's transparent, it's more transparent than the actual system in Spain, and it really goes to productive, uh, productive, um, productive um, services and productive infrastructures. So solutions in a, in a negotiated way, you could find solutions to, to, to get a result that is not too damaging <coughs> to the Spanish economy and not, um, and not damaging to the Catalan economy. But uh, 
the current situation with the political, judiciary, legal, and economic reprisals to prevent independence from happening can have economic damaging consequences for both Catalonia and Spain. I would put an example. There's a, Cata uh, there's a German firm, and it's not Volkswagen. Um, <laughs> just Volkswagen, there was a declaration of the union's leader saying that the king of Spain has called Volkswagen in Germany to ask them to move their, their headquarters from, from Martorell from Barcelona. It, it's not Volkswagen, it's another type of firm um, that um, had received these pressions from the political government, from the Spanish government to move their headquarters from Barcelona, the, the, their, their um, facility in Spain is in Barcelona. They have received this pressure and what they have decided is in the midterm, not doing anything now, but in the, the midterm, quit Spain sell the company in Spain and quit Spain. Because when you are acting, uh, confronting politics in that way to the economy, in the end, everybody loses because a firm would think, oh, it's not a safe place to be. If in, at any moment I can receive this type of political pressures or I, or I can get a decree uh, changing the economic regulation or the conditions. Okay, so that's it um, for a short um, overview of the economic situation. Thank you very much.